and still dancing, running the Vegetarian Society, running yeah. our World Veg Festival, taking care of our business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and still dancing. Yeah, yes. maybe yes. next year at the meet out I'll dance for you. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'd like to do, we really have a privilege this afternoon to have a very special person whom I've known for quite a few years. And He's one of my favorite, favorite speakers, and I'm so happy to have been able to get him to come all the way from Montana. He's our mad cowboy, and you might wonder why he's mad. Is he still mad? What is he mad about? <laughs> well, we're going to find out today. He's going to tell you all about it. He's a fourth generation rancher farmer. He comes right from the roots, and he talks just the way it should be. So. Here's my friend, wonderful Howard Lyman. which happens to be translated into uh, seven different foreign languages. And uh, if it would not have been for her, I would probably would not have gotten the book read or written. So I highly recommend that you buy a copy, write that down, buy a copy. <laughs> came on a dead bull. Thought, boy, couldn't be much better than this. And he sat down and he ate that entire bull. And he felt so good about it. He was sitting there and he was roaring and roaring. And along came a hunter and a hunter shot and killed him. The moral of this story is if you're full of bull, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> your fault. <laughs> I want to talk to you about probably the most serious issue that you've ever been addressed in your entire life. I want to talk to you about opening your eyes to the common sense around us. The famous German philosopher Goethe said, we hide everything in plain sight. And it's no different because if we actually sit down and open our eyes and think, what we need to know is right in front of us. It has been proven time and time again. There is nothing that I'm going to say today that is not scientifically accurate in print in front of us. The, the trouble is it's, it's much easier to just be teased with things that feel better, things that are easier. You know why in the world, if, if there was really something important out there, do you not think that the United States Congress would not address it? <laughs> Can you imagine the California State Legislature, if there was something really important, that it would not be brought up and debated? 
Can you imagine that if there was something that we really needed to know that Barack Obama would not go on national television and share it with the American people? No. We don't have to worry about it because we have all of those people looking out for our best interest. <laughs> you know as well as I do that we don't have to worry about the shortage of water in California because if we were really short of water in California, there is no doubt in the world that the governor, Jerry Brown, would address the people in California and say, look, the largest percentage of irrigation water in California is now being used to grow forage for livestock. Now, I, as Jerry Brown, the governor, want to inform you that I think it would be a better use of our water if we had enough for people to drink, to cook with, and even take a short shower. It would be much better if we did that than to grow alfalfa to put it on a boat and send it to China. You know he would do that, wouldn't he? Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> let's, let's look at some of the things that have happened in human history that are, that are well documented, that indicate to us that there are some significant problems out there. The first thing we need to understand is that worldwide there will be a quarter of a million people that will show up for dinner tonight that were not here yesterday. And tomorrow there will be another quarter of a million, an additional quarter of a million people every day will show up that were not here for dinner the day before. I want to tell you that there are twice as many people on planet Earth today as the day I was born. The fact of it is that if I lay, live to the age I aspire to, that number will double again. Can we do it? I don't want anybody here to say, oh, wait, wait a minute, the Earth will survive. Of course the Earth will survive. The question is, will the human race survive? In 1944, we had a small detachment of soldiers that were on a small island out in the Aleutians. This small island was St. Matthew's Island, 128 square miles. It was uninhabited. And they thought when they put this small detachment of soldiers there, there may be a time due to the war that we will not be able to come and supply those, those troops. And so we should uh, end up with a, a, an ace in the hole just in case something goes wrong. So they moved 29 reindeer onto that island just in case that they were not able to bring supplies to that small detachment of soldiers, that they would not perish. Those 29 reindeer thought they'd died and gone to heaven. There, there were no natural predators. It, it, was, it was reindeer heaven. They couldn't have found a better place. The, the food was magnificent. No wolves, no hunters. Those reindeer thought, we don't really like war, but this war was okay for us. <laughs> well, the end of the war came. They never, they never needed for that detachment to harvest any of those reindeer. The reindeer were thrilled to death. Patty Brightman was thrilled to death. Everybody was going down the same road. The soldiers left, the reindeer were doing what we all know reindeer really like to do, 
make more reindeer. In 20 years, 1964, they went back and they inventoried St. Matthew's Island. Those 29 reindeer had increased substantially. There were 6,000 reindeer. Still no wolves, no hunters. Those reindeer were saying, don't bother us. We found reindeer heaven. Things are great. The food is great. And propagation is going right along. <laughs> they went back 20 years later. What do you think they found? Zero. Not one live reindeer. Not one live reindeer because there were more reindeer than what that island could provide food for. I want you to bring, burn this into your brain right now. Nature does not negotiate. Nature did not say to those reindeer, well, let's see, you want to have more reindeer and I can't take care of them so we're going to negotiate. We're going to have 6,500 reindeer. The reindeer said, look, everything's great. We're going along terrific here. We're having a good time. We're all having enough to eat. And then all of a sudden, they fell off of the table. There was not enough to eat. And it wasn't like the population of the reindeer went from 6,000 to 5,500. It went from 6,000 to zero. Do you think there are any examples of that on the human species? You know, we all know the reindeer are smarter than humans, but maybe, maybe we can find one close example. I'm sure that every one of us here can remember the time when we sat in school and there was a picture of Easter Island. Easter Island, where these large stone monuments are on the beach. But there are no people. What happened to the people? Why did they end up with these stone monuments sitting on the beach and there are no people? There had to be people there at one time to carve them. There had to be people that moved them from the quarry down to the beach. There's recorded history of, of explorers that were out in the ocean that came to Easter Island and sure enough, there were people on Easter Island the number one thing of status of people on Easter Island was to be able to carve a large stone monument, solicit your friends to come and help, cut down the trees, take that large monument, put it on the skids of the trees and pull it down and put it to the beach and stand it up. And if your monument was larger than everybody else's, you ended up with a big attaboy on Easter Island. There were explorers that were there. They saw that happen. Those people were happy. They were there. They were in their own reindeer heaven. They were doing exactly what they wanted, carving out the monuments, cutting down the trees, sliding them down to the beach, standing them up, and taking their kudos. Well, there were some stowaways that came to Easter Island and all of this. When those boats came and those people were happy and they were doing all of these, these stowaways happened to be rats. And the rats looked at it and said, man, if I have a choice of being on that stinking boat or here on the island, I'm going to the island. They encouraged their friends to come and they scampered off, went to the island and the people on the island, they didn't care. There was enough room for everybody. And what the rants were not eating the people food. They were not putting up monuments. They weren't causing trouble. Let those rats do what they want. That's okay. Well, the rats looked around and said, what should we have for dinner? There was no millennium on Easter Island. <laughs> should have been. But the rats looked at it and said, wait a minute, we have the nuts 
from these trees, the seeds that are falling, and they're really good, they're tasty, nobody else is eating them, the rats ate them. Worked out perfect. No problem. The people were carving the monuments, cutting down the trees, letting them down to the mountain, standing them up on the beach, getting a big attaboy, and all of a sudden here are these rats and they're eating the seeds from the trees. And sure enough, the day came that they looked around and they said, you know, we have a problem here. We, we do not have any young trees. We're cutting down the old trees and we're using them or skids to move the rocks down to the beach and we're setting them up, but there's no need, well, nothing to worry about, they're just trees. I mean, it's more important that I end up with this adulation from my fellow people out there. Why in the world should I worry about no more trees? They cut down the last trees. They skidded the largest monument there down to the beach and they set it up. But without trees, there were no more boats. Without boats, there were no more fish. Without trees, there were no more, more seeds for the rats. And so the rats and the humans, they started fighting over the food. And you know, when we go to Easter Island today, we find the stone monuments are stood up and we go into the dump and we dig down into the bones of the dump that's there and you know what we find? We find human bones with human teeth marks on it. The last meal on Easter Island is when people started eating each other. Because they could not bring themselves from the adulation of had all of this cheering of the company because they had the biggest monument and realizing they had to cut down the trees to do it. And when the trees were disappearing, they did not have the ability to stop and say, wait a minute, we better keep some trees alive so that we end up with some seedlings so that we can end up with more trees and we can keep having boats. Would you really believe that humans would be so short-sighted that they could not see the loss of the trees as the loss of their society? At the same time that this was happening in Easter Island, there were a group of islands that it was a little different than Easter Island because there the adulation came because you had more pigs. The more pigs you had, the higher stature you had. And all of a sudden, the elders came together and said, wait a minute, you know, we have a problem. The more of these pigs that we have, the more of the human food supply they're eating. And they sat out and said, we need to limit the amount of pigs on our island, no matter how, how much of a threat that is to someone's stature. And on those islands, they limited the amount of pigs. They ended up with the population that was comfortable for them to support with the food supply that they had. And they made this decision thousands of years ago. And guess what? Today, as we're sitting here today, those islands and those people are still there. They're still viable because they were able to take a look at what was going on around them. They were able to say to themselves, what we're doing is wrong. Are we able to do that? Do you think the Anastasis in the southwest of the United States did that? No but we ended up with the same problem. They cut down the trees and they actually have shown that the irrigation system for the Anastasis, that they carried those trees 150 miles to build their irrigation system. 
And when the trees got further and further away, they had less ability to bring them and to repair them. They lost their irrigation system. When they lost their irrigation system, they lost their supply of food. And when they lost their supply of food, what do we find in the dumps of the Anastasi today? We find human bones with human teeth marks because they could not, they could not live within the restraints of nature. Nature does not negotiate. Should we not? Should we not be looking at what's going on today? Should we not ask ourselves, is the problem, is the problem with California's drought, does it have anything to do with our lifestyle? Does it have anything to do with human involvement? You know, we, we ended up with a term a while ago and it was talked about global warming. Well, do you think we would have some trouble on the East Coast right now talking to those people about human involvement of global warming? When they're up to their ass in snowdrifts, do you think global warming is something that they're worried about on the East Coast? Maybe if we had used the topic of human modification of weather, if we talk about the fact that we end up with holes in the ozone layer that came from human involvement, that we ended up with a larger and larger hole and we are modifying the weather. It is warmer in the summer, it is colder in the winter, it's drier, it's wetter. Human modification of weather, that's exactly what's going on. Are we having, are we having a large dialogue worldwide today about human modification of weather? Is there anybody in doubt that the hole in the ozone layer is growing? Is there any doubt in anybody's mind that the polar ice caps are shrinking? Do you realize within your lifetime we will probably see for the first time in human recorded in industry that the ships from the Atlantic Ocean will be able to go over the polar ice cap to the Pacific Ocean. It's happening. Should we not ask ourselves, uh, do, do we have some involvement in that? How, how much can this happen? As we stand here today, the majority of the gases that are attacking the hole in the ozone layer are coming from livestock. So I'm sure that you and I both know that the California Cattlemen's Association is leading the dialogue in Sacramento right now that we should limit the amount of livestock so that we would end up, you know, cutting back on the largest contributor to the hole in the ozone layer. You know, and the state of Washington is the one that approved the sale of marijuana. And you guys are sitting there saying, yeah, well, I remember that, that the cattlemen did that. And you know, no. Why? Because of greed. Because of greed. Do you, do you think that those reindeer on St. Matthew's Island were looking at it and saying, wait a minute, if the food supply is getting short, maybe we should, we should get together and talk about limiting the number of reindeer that are here. No, they didn't do that. Until they fall off of the cliff, nobody wants to talk about what the problem is. Let's, let's just look at maybe, maybe there's human involvement in modification of the weather we're seeing the polar ice caps melt. We're seeing that right now. If we melt the ice cap in the Antarctic, 
it's going to raise the ocean level 60 meters. Can you imagine that we would be sitting in this room today with water up to here if that happened? But that's probably not going to happen in the lifetime of the people in this room, so let somebody else worry about that. Let's just talk about what really is happening. We're seeing the, the polar ice cap melt. The polar ice cap happens to cover something that's called the permafrost. And the permafrost is just, you know, frozen land under the ice cap. If we melt the permafrost, which is now being exposed, which is starting to melt, we will end up with enough gases on the atmosphere that we will melt the Greenland ice shield. Melting the Greenland ice shield will raise the ocean levels worldwide by seven feet. Well, that's a whole lot better than 60 meters of the Antarctic ice field. But what kind of an impact is seven feet of ocean mean level going to cause? I'm sure that some of you realized that the state of Florida may have the screwiest electoral of anyone. The average mean elevation in Florida is seven feet. If we melt, if we melt the, the permafrost, which is now being exposed, it's not just if it could happen, it is happening. The temperature rising will melt the Greenland ice field, which is happening right now, raising the ocean seven feet. The state of Florida will be underwater. I want you to realize this is the good news. The bad news is one out of every three people on the face of the earth residing today is living in an area that will be covered if the ocean levels rise seven feet. One out of every three, two billion people. What do we do with two billion boat people can you imagine the economic disaster? The economic disaster that is going to happen worldwide when you end up with one out of three people on the planet being displaced? Where do you put them? How do you feed them? How do you house them? Where do you get the water for them? Or do you even care? That's the discussion we should be having right now. It is happening in front of us. It is happening as we sit here today. And there is no conversation going on about it in Sacramento. There is no conversation going on with it in Washington, D.C. There is no conversation going on with it on the United Nations. What are we going to do? I came from Montana. I want to address that. You know, I, w I was raised, I was raised on an organic farm in Montana. I thought it was the Garden of Eden to wake up in the morning and we would end up with a dew on the grass and the birds were singing and the trees and the, it was just fantastic. I thought there would be nothing in the world that could be better than living on an organic farm in Montana. 
I made a mistake. I went to Montana State University. I learned about herbicides, pesticides, hormones, and medication. I soaked up that information like a sponge because I knew we had to feed a hungry world. And I want to be part of that revolution, feeding the world. And I started using chemicals and herbicides and pesticides, and I thought the birds disappear. I saw the trees die. I saw the soil that when I was a kid, you would go out with a shovel and you could turn it over, and there were a myriad of, of worms. And after using all of the chemicals, when you went out and you dug a hole and you turned it over in an entire day on an entire farm, you could not find a worm. I should have, at that time, looked at it and said, wait a minute, we're going the wrong direction. But I was listening to the siren call that said, we need to feed a hungry world. We need to get bigger. We need to get better. This is where you need to go. Montana State University was not saying grow organically. They were saying follow the chemical junkies and become part of the bandwagon. It was wrong. It was wrong. My brother died of Hodgkin's disease, and it wasn't until years later, and I was talking to T. Colin Campbell, who wrote the book Whole, the man that identified dioxin, the most demical, dangerous chemical in the face of the earth that almost killed him, that paralyzed all of the muscles in his face. And he was sitting in my office in Washington, D.C., and he said to me, he said, have you ever had anybody in your family die of cancer? And I said, yes, my brother died of Hodgkin's disease. He said, you realize Hodgkin's disease had dioxin, the same thing we used in Vietnam that was called Agent Orange. Really? Yeah. He said it paralyzed my face. It almost killed me. We didn't know what it was back then. This was T. Colin Campbell that did the largest dietary study that was ever done in the history of the world. The New York Times, the New York Times called it the Cadillac of all dietary studies that have ever been done. And it was done on hundreds of thousands of people. And it was done in the place where they took blood pressure and they took urine samples and they took the history and they knew where people came from, what they ate, how long they lived there. And the information in that study was so massive that it took years Years, I'm not sure even today whether they have been able to process all of the data. But you know what they learned? The largest dietary study that was ever done in the world, they learned that heart disease, one out of every two Americans dying of heart disease, one out of every three Americans dying of cancer, diabetes growing astronomically, 40% of Americans today considered to be obese. Those four major contributors of American human health, you know what the China study, the largest dietary study done in the history of the world showed us? That there was a direct relationship to each and every one of them to one thing, animal protein. I will defy anyone to show up here today and say I did the largest dietary study in the hair area of the world and we found carrots. Carrots are the number one cause of obesity. <laughs> broccoli. We all know that dreaded broccoli. Heart disease. Doesn't happen. But why is it? Why is it when we have the information that we have it in hand, done by some of the greatest scientists the world has ever known? Why is it that we will not take a look at it and say, this is factual, we ought to live with it? Because money, 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 greed, greed, greed. Don't do what we know. Can you remember when you were in school? And they said early on, 
people looked at it and said, don't go out in the ocean there, you'll fall off. Everybody knows the world is flat. When you get to the end, no doubt about it. We found out that that was not true. It took a while to convince the world that planet Earth was round. You would think that it would take a while, but all of a sudden we would learn that heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity are all directly related to animal products. We're going to stop and take a look at it. That we're going to change, that we're going to end up with guidelines for the American consumer that we're going to basically say, we found that smoking, done exactly as instructed on the package, and if you do it judiciously, you will find that it will be 100% fatal. <laughs> well, should we not have a label that's out there that says, if you continue to eat this hamburger as instructed, will end up assisting in the growth of your heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and obesity. Well, we're, we're an intelligent society, and so we'd say, well, <laughs> we're not going to eat hamburger, I'll tell you that. But how about a pork chop? <laughs> it's animal protein. Animal protein. If you want to read the scientific analysis of what I'm talking about, go to Dr. T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study. It's there in spades. It is irrefutable. It was done as it, with the assistance of the Chinese government, the largest dietary study that was done in the history of the world. And you know why? Because the leader of China was dying of cancer, and he wanted to know what was causing it. And they put up hundreds of millions of dollars and constructed the finest study that was ever done, and it is now being denied day after day with the money from the meat and the dairy and the chicken and you name it. You know, but it tastes so good. I mean, there, there's no... Uh, it, you know, while I may die from it, it'll, I'm, I'm getting older every day. Stop and take a look. What was the United States of America like a hundred years ago? A hundred years ago. And we'll see what happened from a hundred years ago till today. And I'll bet you there's a lot of good news there. And we're going to find that even though our diet is killing us. It's killing us at an older age than it ever did before, so there is some good news. 1902, average age of Americans, 47 years old. There's not one person sitting in this room today that's not sitting there saying, yep, see there? We're living older than we used to, right? Yeah. Can you imagine 1902, the average, the average job was paying 22 cents an hour? I mean, we have, we have today minimum wage far in excess of that, so we're doing a lot better than that. Realize 1902, there was only 14% of the homes in America that had a bathtub. Can you imagine what this audience would have smelled like in 1902? 95% <laughs> of births were at home in 1902. Now, my wife and I came today, we drove down from Ellensburg, Washington, to your fair community, and we got here, and you have everything except parking. <laughs> In 1902, there were only 8,000 cars in America. When I was looking for a parking spot this morning, there were 8,000 cars circling the block, <laughs> waiting for somebody to leave. And you could see everybody looking at their watch. What time do you think the service is over? 1902, 144 miles of paved roads, speed limit. 
10 miles an hour. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? 1902, city in Nevada, Las Vegas. 30 people inhabited Las Vegas, 1902. Man, there's been some phenomenal changes. But that was 112 years ago. 112. There were 112 people standing in line for the parking spot I got off. <laughs> you, know, you, you imagine? What's it going to be like if we are alive in another 100 years? Are we going to be able to say, we're like the reindeer, and we went from six billion people down to zero? Are we going to be able to say, we were like those islands in the Pacific that we could look at the problem that we had, and we could address that problem, and we could change our lifestyle so that our children and our grandchildren could live in the future? There's nothing in the world that concerns me more than the fact that I look at right now that, that we're going towards a cliff at 100 miles an hour. I look in the eyes of my children and grandchildren and I can't say to them, we're going in the right direction. Of course, there are more people that are vegetarian or vegan today. And there is no doubt in my mind the day I die, the majority of people in the United States of America will be eating a plant-based diet. No doubt in my mind about that. Is that going to be enough? Was there not a time when the reindeer looked at it and said, oh my God, don't take another bite. Don't reproduce one more reindeer. Or was it too late even then? What do we do about it? Now, I'm sure that when I finish speaking today that you're all going to run over to that table and you're going to purchase a number of books <laughs> and videos. And besides that, the group deal can't be beat. You can get all of the books, all of the videos for a pittance. You can inundate every friend, every family member you have with information that they will shun you for almost forever. <laughs> you know, we could go out on the corner here, and we can go out on Franklin and Gary, and we can stand there, and every car that comes by will shout, become a vegan. <laughs> they will wave. I'm not sure how many fingers they're going to wave with, but they will wave. <laughs> or we can stop and look at it and say, what is the most effective? What is the most effective? You know, if you take Patty and her book, you get her book, delve into it, find a recipe that you really like, cook a meal, and invite a carnivore. <laughs> and you don't want to have them come over and say, well, I want you to know that I saw Patty Brightman, I got a copy of her book, and I'm telling you, this is her recipe, and it's vegan, and it's good for the world, and you're going to love it. You know, you do that, I guarantee your carnivore friend is going to say to you, I'm going to wave to you the same way those people out in Franklin and Gary waved. <laughs> What you want to do is invite them over and say, we haven't got together a long time. Why don't we get together and have a meal together? I, I find this recipe just fascinating and I thought maybe you would enjoy it. You don't want to tell them it's good for them. <laughs> you don't want to tell them they're going to live longer. You don't want to tell them it's going to cure their heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and obesity. You want to bite your tongue and say, if you keep eating like this, you're going to live longer, even though you don't mean it. But remember, the thing that changes the world is when we become a billboard of what we believe in. You know, every time you see 
an attractive vegan that is not overweight, that is like me, middle-aged, <laughs> you're a billboard. I go to my class reunion. Remember, I graduated Great Falls, Montana. Not, not the most forward-thinking spot in the world, but I go to my class reunion, I walk in, one-third of my classmates have already died. You never saw so many canes, crutches, and walkers in all your life. And do you think that people come up to me and say, hey, Lyman, geez, you look great. How's your diet? No, no, no. I go to the bathroom, they come up to me and they say, you ever sneak out and get a burger? I always try to tell them that there is a downside to being a vegan. You have to attend a lot more funerals than those other guys. <laughs> now, many of them, they don't get that. What, do you get special invitations? Yeah, how does that happen? Can I get on that list? Is, is there an app for that? <laughs> no one. No one wants to join a movement that is all doom and gloom. That's why I love following Patty. She only knows somewhere around eight or 9,000 jokes I've never heard. <laughs> And she is more than willing to share them all with me. <laughs> but what we want to do is, is we want to become that billboard of the movement that we would like to join. Coming here today, what a wonderful meal. You know, you didn't have to come here and Dixie didn't put up a sign that says, well, if you come, we'll have a healthy meal. You knew it was going to be a healthy meal. What you looked at is, is, is it going to taste good? I've done some cooking that was healthy. <laughs> Check with my wife. She'll tell you it was not very tasty. <laughs> Let's look at the fact that we only have one life to live. We can't sit around and say, I'm going to wait for Sacramento. I'm not going to wait for Washington, D.C. I'm going to do what I can do. The first day of the rest of your life is starting today. I want each and every one of you to remember. I have, I have a, a rule to live with in the future. If we're going to be successful, if we're going to change the world, the first thing we have to do is know when we get up in the morning, is it a great day? I get up in the morning. I run to the front door. I grab the newspaper. I check the obituary page. If I'm not on it, it's a great day. <laughs> I live in Ellensburg, Washington. The Washington State Cattlemen their headquarters is in my hometown. I know they're getting up every morning, running to the front door, grabbing the newspaper, checking the obituary page, and they're saying, oh, damn, he hasn't died yet. <laughs> we have made phenomenal movement from the first time that I ever was smart enough to change my diet. I can remember I would get on an airplane and I would say, you remember back when airplanes had food? <laughs> I mean, we didn't have terrorists, but the food was pretty terrible. <laughs> I would always order a vegan meal. Now, I knew I would never get it. But the stewardess would come around, I'd say, but I ordered a vegan meal. She would jump back. She thought I had a communicable disease. <laughs> but after I found out that they saved my meal so they could eat it, <laughs> then 
I realized we're moving along. We're going in the right direction. I would go to a truck stop and I would say to the white person at the truck stop, I'm a vegan. <laughs> Is that a new model of a truck? <laughs> No. Well, she said that I don't care. I said, do you have anything without animal protein in it? She said, don't you like the water? <laughs> you go there today and you tell somebody you're a vegan, they're saying, so, what do you want? You can go and get a good vegan meal at a truck stop today. Not something you'd send your mother-in-law to have, but I mean, it's there. <laughs> we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. When you look in the eyes of our children and grandchildren, realize that the future of the human race is involved in what you and I do the rest of the time that we draw breath on the planet Earth. Patty writes a book that you can share with your carnivore friends. I wrote books that you can buy, and I'll guarantee you I'll share your wealth <laughs> reforming carnivores. But the San Francisco Vegetarian Society has done yeoman's work over the years. The first time, the first time I met Dixie, she looked exactly the same. <laughs> Stan is a little different, but Dixie is right on. Stan never danced. He and I should have been dancing. But the work that Dixie has done attempting to change the world is phenomenal. I don't want you to think that San Francisco is replicated time and time again in the United States of America. That is not true. But ask yourself, is it not true that almost every environmental movement that we have adopted in the United States of America did not start in California. Why in the world is it that within our lifetime that we could not start the movement in California to change the entire world? We have the capability of doing that. You've done it before. All we need to do is look at it and say, I'll do what I can do as long as I'm drawing breath on the planet Earth. There's reason for it. The scientific information is out there infallible. So, look at it and say, I can't do everything, but I can do something. And I will. I always try and look at what I do and I ask myself the question, have I ever measured up to Dixie? <laughs> and the answer is no. I will not take dance lessons. <laughs> I want to thank you for coming. I want you to realize that every change in the world always started with one. If you don't think one can make a difference, spend a night in a tent with one mosquito. <laughs> one does make a difference. And you have total control over that one. Join with me. Let's change the world one bite at a time and remember nature does not negotiate. Thank you very much.
time for a few questions. Patty will be over here, be more than happy to sell you a book. Well, let's ask, if you have some questions, maybe we can take a couple of questions now. Two, uh, two questions. Well, it didn't take long to answer that. We're going to use this. Will you Are you going to write any more books? Uh, my wife has encouraged me to write a book basically to my grandson. You know, if, if you write uh, Mad Cowboy or No More Bull, you will find that it is not the complete story uh, of my life. And so she has encouraged me to do that. I have not capitulated yet, but uh, maybe if Pavi does what she did the last time and comes to me and say, hey, idiot, get off of it, get it written, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> yes, um, I have a question. I have a lady friend whose daughter went vegan after reading Charlotte's Web, and <laughs> her daughter has lost some weight. And her mother, my friend, is so worried, and she says to me that her daughter is malnourished because she has lost some weight, and she has turned vegan. How would you respond to that? How would you you know, tell that mother that she is not well, nourished? I think the thing that I would do is I would basically go to the obituary page and I would, I would look and see whether there was anybody that died uh, and it said, cause of death, malnutrition. <laughs> Second thing I would do is I would take people that were middle-aged and uh, I would attend their funeral and talk to the, the uh, mourners and find out whether there was any chance that they had heart disease, cancer, diabetes, or obesity, or malnutrition. Any more? Okay. Yes. Um, I One more. Uh, you said that all the uh, reindeer on the island died. Uh, the reason that all of them died is because the overgrazing was phenomenal and it exposed the herd to health problems. And what they found is the last 42 that were alive were so sickly, even though the forage was growing back, that they were so sickly they were not able to survive. It went from 29 to 6,000 to zero. I am of the opinion that if we look at the melting of the ice fields and the melting of the Greenland ice cap by raising the world sea level by seven feet, which is minuscule compared to what would happen if the Antarctic melted, that the economic impact would be so phenomenal, I do not believe that the human race could survive in that. And besides that, why should we? <laughs> is, is the consumption of animal protein worth that? So anyway, I will be at my table. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. I want to thank you for the most valuable gift in the world that you could give me. And that is your time. You have been a marvelous audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.